serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. We begin by singing this morning a version of Psalm 2. You'll find it in our blue books at number 2b, the second version of uh, Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and cry, plotting against the Lord's Most High? Number 2b. as we sit, let's join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. We bow in your presence, O Lord our God, you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power, by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel mighty indeed, whose eyes are upon all the ways of the children of man, who towers over every earthly power, and as we have sung, who will laugh to scorn at the last, all who dare to mock and deride your rule. 
on that great day when at last your power and your glory and your wrath against sin and evil will be revealed to all the universe. And all evil and wickedness will at last be destroyed. And yet you are the one who declares in your great and infinite mercy, declares safety for all who seek refuge under your wing, for all who hide themselves in Christ and who take upon their lips and cherish in their hearts the name of Jesus, your Son. How we rejoice, Lord, that we do name you King and Lord through the wonders of your merciful love made known to us in Jesus Christ, your Son, our great Savior. Whence to us this waste of love, we who are no better than any and who know that we are far, far worse than so many. But in your covenant mercy, in your grace, in your boundless love, you have looked upon us forever and chosen to share that boundless love with us and called us to be yours through Jesus, our great Redeemer, and bound us to you in an everlasting covenant of grace so that we may know that we are yours forever. How we praise you, God Most High, and how we long to so love this great gospel of grace and so live it before the world that we might shine your glories to the whole world that others, men and women, boys and girls, might see and might also taste and savor and rejoice in all that you have made ours. So, Lord, come to us, we pray, this morning as we gather as a people who name your name. Fill our hearts today, we pray, with the wonders of your grace, and send us on our way humbled and yet rejoicing in the depth and the length and the height and the breadth of your wondrous covenant love to us. So hear us, O God, our Father. Draw near to us, we pray, and thrill us with the words of your grace. For we ask it in Jesus Christ, our Savior's name. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to all of you this morning, upstairs here where I can see you, and downstairs where I trust that you can see and hear. If you're visiting with us, then you're very particularly welcome, and uh, if it's your first time, let me say that we rejoice to welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus to our fellowship here. Uh, a number of notices uh, and things now. I, I'd like you to uh, have a look at these sheets that are on your seats or uh, that you were given on the way in, you'll see that there are numbers of things there for our attention. And in the middle inside, there are all the things happening this coming week, and uh, you'll take note of those, uh, I hope. Uh, I'm going to say a little more in just a moment about uh, Disciple and about uh, Christianity Explored. But uh, please uh, note the small groups taking place this Wednesday, and uh, if you've uh, been relatively new to us and are not part of one of the small groups that meets and would like to be them, please do come and speak to us. We'd love to help you to find one uh, that would be near or convenient for you, and uh, you can contact Paul uh, at the email address there if you'd like to know more. Speaking of Paul, we're delighted to announce that uh, Paul and Steph have had a little baby girl born yesterday, Jessica, and uh, we're thrilled for them, and uh, I'm sure you will want to uh, assure them of your delight and your prayers also. So, Congratulations to the Brenham family. Then, just under Nota Benny, at the end there, you'll see on the right-hand side at the bottom, Gospel Partners Calendar for 2014. I think today is probably the last day that you'll be able to get those. They're almost running out. So if you haven't yet got yours, uh, they will be available after the services. Somebody will have them uh, on the landing out there and at the door. And uh, make sure that you uh, get hold of that, and it'll be a very useful calendar for you. But more importantly, it will remind you to pray for 
uh, gospel partners throughout the year. Well, uh, I said I'd say something about Christianity Explored, and I want to do that by asking Chris here, Chris Fitzpatrick, to come and uh, just take the microphone. Uh, Chris, welcome, and thank you for uh, coming up here with me uh, this morning. I want to ask you just one or two questions, but um, for those who don't know you, it's not that long ago that you became a Christian, so would you like to just remind us when you came to faith and uh, just very briefly tell us how that, how that came about? Yeah, sure. Um, I became a Christian just over a year ago now, um, and the, my life really has been spent dealing with various struggles such as alcoholism, and it was through um, coming to the Tron and the We Recovery meeting that takes place on the Wednesday afternoon that I understood that my my main problem wasn't just the drinking, it was the fact of my sin and that I needed to deal with that. And um, fortunately, through God's saving grace, I was given faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And it's been a, a, a fantastic transformative year for me through Christ. And you had your anniversary, I think, of that just the other, just the other week, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, um, on the 7th of January. Um, I was a, a year sober and a year Christian. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And you were uh, giving your testimony to the Tron at Two service last week, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that was the, um, the first nervous thing I've done this, <laughs> this year. And I, I, I'm learning it's not going to be the last, probably. <laughs> no, it, prob- it probably isn't, Chris, so, but thank you. Well, that's great, and I hope that we will have a chance at some later stage to hear a little bit more uh, about that. But you became a Christian, and then you went on the Christianity Explored course yes. after that. Is that right? Yes. Tell us, um, uh, tell us a little bit then about why you did that and what the course covered and what, what help you found from it. Well, the, the reason that the, um, the course was of interest to me is that although I'd already committed myself to Jesus Christ, that I found that I, I was quite ignorant about what Christianity actually meant. And I, I realized that um, the Tron did a course called Christianity Explored and having looked briefly into it, um, over the course of seven weeks, you go through all the key topics of Christianity, such as um, who Jesus was, why he came, um, key ideas such as sin and grace. And we were guided as a group um, to look at these topics by referring to Mark's gospel from beginning to end. And I, I thought that would be a, a really good way for me to um, embrace faith and to understand what it is to be a Christian and what Jesus Christ did for me. And you enjoyed it? Oh, very much so. Um, I, I found it a very kind of relaxed atmosphere. Um, we, had, we had a small group and uh, each week we, we'd meet up, we'd talk, we'd have a, a coffee, get to know each other, and then each week we'd be guided through, um, through um, by using questions through Mark's Gospel, and it was, it was very informal, but very informative as well with it. Good. So we're starting a new course next week. Mm-hmm. Um, who would you encourage to come on that course? Well, I would encourage anybody who's, who's not a Christian but is interested in finding out what Christianity is and the course is ideally suited for them. Um, but also, if, if you're a new Christian and you want to learn more about what Jesus did, then um, I certainly benefited from, from coming to it. And um, as we're in the, the run-up to Easter, I guess we've been saying now, and anybody who enjoys Mark's gospel, who wants to get um, reacquainted with that, that wonderful document, then mm-hmm. there's nothing better to, to spend an hour or two on a, an evening, once a week, than to go through Mark's gospel together as a wee fellowship. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed, Chris, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, that's been helpful for some of you to hear from him, and that uh, if that is you that Chris is talking about, then you'll come along next Friday and uh, see uh, if you can find out exactly what uh, Chris found in doing that course. We'd love for you to come, and uh, we'd love you to bring friends or family members, and I hope that just hearing a little bit about it this morning uh, has given you a a bit of an idea about what that would be uh, all about. Thank you very much, Chris. Now, I've got Kieran Dodds, who's going to come and speak about <coughs> Disciple. 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 I wish Chris could do it, actually. That was brilliant. Um, so if you look at your notice sheet, rather than staring at me, um, <laughs> Disciple is a small group that meets on Wednesdays at 7 p.m., and it's designed to integrate the gospel into every part of your life. So it's kind of a follow-up to Christianity Explored. That's what it's designed for. But actually, if you've been away from church for a while and you're coming back, it's also for you. It's to sort of go over every part of life where the gospel touches. Also, if you've been a Christian for a long time, it's sometimes hard when we compartmentalize our life. We become a 90-minute Christian, perhaps. But on Monday morning, how does it go into our workplace? How do we think about it in our sports club? That's what Disciple is about. So we're meeting up actually weekly um, this term. 
Um, we're going to go uh, to the prayer meeting as a group uh, every second uh, week when we're not doing the studies. Um, so do come along to that if, if you can. We meet downstairs at 7 o'clock uh, for delicious refreshments and biscuits, uh, as Edward Lobb would uh, commend. And then we move up to room 7, which is the most comfortable and lavishly furnished in all of the halls. So as Chris says, it's very informal. Um, you might have to fight him for the chaise long, but um, it's, it's a very uh, nice environment. So if you want to know more, uh, do email me. My email's on there. Don't spam me. And uh, I'm also going to be at the bottom of the, sp the, uh, the stairs um, at the end of the service. So please come along um, if you can on Wednesday, 7 p.m. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, Kieran. We're going to turn now to our Bible reading this morning, and uh, you'll find it in the prophet Jeremiah. If you have one of our church visitors' Bibles, I think it's page 660. If not, it's kind of about in the middle of your Bibles. And we're in Jeremiah chapter 32. Last week we were reading in this great chapter 31 about the uh, promise of the new covenant, and this chapter continues on in that same way, although it has a dark side to it as well, as we'll see. Jeremiah 32 at verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar the great king of Babylon. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, for Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. And he shall take Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall remain until I visit him, declares the Lord. Though you fight against the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed." Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shulam, your uncle, will come to you and say, Buy my field that is Anato, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy my field that is at Anato in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord, and I bought the field at Anatot from Hanamel, my cousin, weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on the scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, son of Meshiah, in the presence of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. I charged Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware vessel that they may last for a long time. But thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. After I'd given the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, it is you who has made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel, mighty indeed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the children of man, rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. You have shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, and to this day in Israel and among all mankind, and have made a name for yourself as at this day. 
You brought your people, Israel, out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, and with a strong hand and outstretched arm, and, with great t- and against great terror. You gave them this land, which you swore to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they entered and took possession of it, but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They did nothing of all you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have made all this disaster come upon them. Behold, the siege mounds have come up to the city to take it. And because of sword and famine and pestilence, the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against us. What you spoke has come to pass. And behold, you see it. Yet you, O Lord God, have said to me, buy the field for money and get witnesses though the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hands of the Chaldeans and into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. The Chaldeans who are fighting against this city shall come and set the city on fire and burn it with the houses on whose roofs offerings have been made to Baal and drink offerings have been poured out to other gods to provoke me to anger. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. The children of Israel have done nothing but provoke me to anger by the works of their hands, declares the Lord. This city has aroused my anger and wrath from the day it was built to this day so that I will remove it from my sight because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah that they did to provoke me to anger. Their kings and their officials, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they have turned to me their back and not their face. Though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. They set up their abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it. They built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Molech. Though I did not command them, nor did it enter my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place, and I will make them dwell in safety. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for their own good and for the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant, that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts, that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good, and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great disaster upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. Fields shall be bought in this land of which you're saying it's a desolation without man or beast that's given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Fields shall be bought for money, and deeds shall be signed and sealed and witnessed in the land of Benjamin, in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of Shepelah, and in the cities of the Negev. For I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. Amen. And may God bless us with this, his word. We're going to sing again a hymn that speaks of 
the great grace and mercy and friendship that is ours in our Lord Jesus Christ. Number 614, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. Number 614. As the musicians play now for a few minutes, our offerings will be received. You might like to use the time to uh, look again at these words of the prophet that we'll be studying shortly. As we do that in the quiet, our offerings will be received.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you bringing these gifts, knowing that we bring to you only that which you have given to us. And we are reminded of the bounty of your blessings which have fallen on us in such a multiplicity of ways, not only the eternal spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, but also so much that you have blessed us with in this material world. So privileged we are in comparison to so many. As we look around the world in the news reports and all the things that we hear and see and read of, we cannot fail to give thanks for the blessings of a land of peace and of relative plenty, indeed great excess. Teach us, Lord, we pray to be thankful people with thankful hearts, not dishonoring you by grumbling and wishing we had more, but rejoicing in all that you have blessed us with. And grant that we might be a people generous in heart and in spirit to share all that you have given our lives in this world for the eternal world of your kingdom. That our great concern might be to build not with straw and stubble, but with gold and silver and precious stones, that which is lasting, that which will be forever. Help us to be a people whose greatest desire is to build up treasures, not on earth, but in heaven. That all that we are and have, our time, our talents, and our money, might be at the disposal of you, our King, our Savior, our Lord. That your kingdom might increase, that the blessings of Christ might flow to this earth's end. That we together might join with all of your people throughout the world and speed the coming of the great day when our King shall at last be revealed and all righteousness will be restored. How needful is our world, O God, for that righteousness that only Christ the King can bring. If you look at the news reports of wars, of turmoil, of bloodshed, and we grieve, O God, for the state of the human heart. Yet we know, Lord, that that is a heart that we also share, and that but for the grace and mercy of Christ, our position would be as lost and pitiful as any. We pray, Lord, for the awful goings-on in the Central African Republic and how we win so, God, when we hear news reports of so-called Christian forces committing terrible atrocities, even cannibalism. How can these things be spoken of or mentioned in the name of Christ? Lord, have mercy on that land, on the warring factions of different communities, where they be, whether they be Muslim or Christian, so-called. Would you bring peace? Would you bring a restraint of evil and that thirst and desire for revenge which is so bitter and which boils over into such ugliness and hatred and terrible atrocity. We think of the land of Syria, Lord, still being torn apart by strife and warfare. We thank you that there are signs that perhaps there might be hope with this planned peace conference in Geneva next week. And we do ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bring to that negotiating table those leaders of the different factions in a spirit that seeks genuinely to bring an end to the conflict, to bring an end to the terrible killings, the dispossession of hundreds of thousands, even millions of people. Have mercy, Lord, we pray. We think of our own nation, O oh God, and our news headlines filled in these last few days of this tragic story of this little child gone missing and now found dead, Mikhail, in Edinburgh, and the ghastly shadow overhanging that of the mother now in custody being charged in connection with 
his death. O oh, Heavenly Father, hear us, we pray. Have mercy on our land and on our people. We think, Lord, of the leaders of our nation, both in Holyrood and in Westminster. We pray, Lord, that you would give them and give us hearts that desire righteousness in public life, truth and honesty in public discourse, integrity in the personal lives of those whose public lives cannot but be touched by the quality of their own lives in every part. What shame it brings upon a nation, Lord, when its leadership and institutions are found to be corrupt and wanting. Think of all that we've seen in the newspapers of France and her president this week. How we lament, O oh God, the fallenness of our human natures, and lest we should be proud, lest we should be arrogant and uh, censorious and look down upon others. A moment's reflection of our own hearts reminds us that we too are frail, sinful flesh. How we need the grace of a Savior, how we need the transforming power of the spirit of holiness, the spirit of our risen Savior, the perfect Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can write his law upon our hearts, who alone can transform human beings into the image of true humanity, the perfect beauty of Jesus himself. And so, Lord, we pray for your church in every place in our land, that she would be strong and clear and bold and true, that wherever men and women and boys and girls are gathered today in our nation in groupings large and small, in the name of Christ, that there should be truth and light, not confusion and obfuscation. Forgive us, Lord, when, as so often in your church, there appears to be greater concern for the praise of man than for the praise of God. The desire to fit in with the culture, to be praised by the intelligentsia and the media, rather than to stand firmly and truly for the word that is spoken by God himself. As Jeremiah the prophet was unafraid to do, imprisoned and scorned by the powers that be, because when the Lord spoke his word, he could do no other but speak on that word to his world. We pray, Lord, for those in churches in every place in our land who are seeking to be true to that word, whatever it might cost them. We think this morning very particularly and especially of our brothers and sisters in Holyrood Abbey Church in Edinburgh, meeting today after their morning service and then meeting on Wednesday evening with a delegation from the Presbytery of Edinburgh and the uh, central authorities of the Church of Scotland. We stand, Lord, in absolute solidarity with them. We love them, we cherish them, and we ask for them that today as they meet, you would be in the midst of them in a way so tangible, so obvious, so clear, and so powerful that they would know that the presence of the Lord of hosts is with them, and therefore nothing else in all the world can ever matter. We pray that you would give them a unity of mind and of heart, that where there are those, Lord, who through whatever reason are wavering and lacking, that you would grant them eyes to see, minds with absolute clarity to know what they must do to be true to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, hear our prayers, we ask. It is so easy for us as we look at this world and as we look at your church today, it's so easy for us to be discouraged. But remind us, Lord, that you are in the midst of all this, the God of grace, the God of mercy, the God of love, and the God of power. 
We thank you for our brother Chris's testimony to us this morning, reminding us of that mighty power from heaven that reaches down and touches the lives of men and women, transforming them and changing them and rescuing them forever. Remind us, O oh God, of your power in our own lives and all that you have done for us. Point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his words of promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us as we go out into all the world to make disciples of all nations. Remind us, O oh God, whose throne is the throne of earth and heaven. And make our hearts strong, we pray. Make us people of courage. Make us people of purpose. Make us those who will stand for Jesus Christ, no matter what this world may say or what it might do. And so, Lord, make us a people who on the great day of your appearing will stand and sing for joy and never be found hanging our heads in shame. So, Lord, draw near to us, we pray, because we know that we need your strengthening. We need your grace. We need your comfort. We need your help. We need you every hour. So come to us again afresh. Meet us, we pray, in your word this morning. And teach us to love and to trust you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Bob comes to preach to us, then we sing again number 256. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea. He rides upon the storm. Number 256.
Now, I could ask you to have your Bibles open, please, at page 660, Jeremiah 32, and we'll have a moment's prayer as we, before we look at this passage. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you that we hold in our hands not simply the words you once spoke, but the words that are eternal, the words that are living, the words that are powerful, words that will cause our hearts to burn, words that will open our eyes, and above all, words that we pray will lead us to the Lord Christ, the living Word, in whose name we pray. Amen. The poet Blake said, when the sun rises, what do you see? Do you see a golden disc that looks like a coin, or do you hear a multitude of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty? Fact is, both are true, and both represent different ways of looking at reality. We have the way of looking, if you like, through the created order to see the power of the Creator Himself, looking beyond the circumstances to see the truth of the everlasting covenant. And we have the actual experience of every day, very often the difficult, very often the dismal, very often the trying and tedious experiences of everyday life. And we've got both of these in Jeremiah. Now, in chapters 31 and 32, chapters we looked at the last two weeks, there is the poetry the multitude of the heavenly host crying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. The wonder, the excitement, the rich poetry of Jeremiah as he celebrates the new creation. Here, if you like, we come to the prose, the circumstances and the feelings in which Jeremiah received that revelation, and they are difficult and dismal. Jeremiah is in prison, the city is only months, perhaps only weeks, from its final destruction. Remember Jeremiah had been prophesying the destruction of the city and beyond it the coming of the covenant. Now, we, we're here in the same place in this chapter, but we learn an awful lot more about the circumstances of Jeremiah, the feelings of Jeremiah, the situation he was in. And we need both. If we are simply going to, if you like, recite the poetry we're going to have unrealistic expectations of life on earth. We're going to claim for the Christian life on earth what's only true of the church in heaven. We are, and we're going to end up disillusioned when we meet difficulties, when we meet problems, and we find that the glowing stories don't seem to be true. We are in danger of going astray, even losing our faith. On the other hand, if we simply judge reality by our own feelings and our own experiences and what's happening, we are also going to become disillusioned. You see, we need both. We need the vision and we need the perseverance to keep on going, and the two are very closely related. Now, the structure of the chapter is very clear. We have a story in verses 1 to 15. We have a prayer in verses um, 16 to 25, and we have the reply of the Lord Himself in verse 26 to the end of the chapter. Powerful words for perplexing times is what I'm calling this. I just thought as we were singing that hymn, I would have been better to have taken the title from the chapter itself. So since the, since the title on the order of service is not written in stone, I'm going to change the title to Nothing is Too Hard for the Lord. That seems to me a better title. It's always good if you can get the title from the passage itself. Anyway, let's first of all look at the story. And I'm going to, this is about faith which takes risks. Verses 1 to 15, faith is about taking risks. The times are bad, both, as I say, both for the city and for Jeremiah. And remember, this is the context in which he's received the wonderful revelation of the new covenant and now of the everlasting covenant. And this story really falls into two parts. The first few verses down to verse 5 is about the realism of faith and the irrationality of unbelief. 
Now, very often, the opposite is said by skeptics, isn't it? Said that faith is irrational, that faith is foolish, but here, the realism of faith. Jeremiah is in prison, and he's in prison for telling the truth, and the truth is pretty grim. Not just that the city is going to fall, but the city is going to fall because the Lord Himself is giving it into the hand of the Babylonian king. Verse 3, Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him, saying, Why do you prophesy thus? Says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, the son of the great Josiah, inherited none of his father's godliness, none of his father's gifts of leadership. Zedekiah comes across as a born loser. In fact, they're a pretty miserable bunch of kings on the whole, from Rehoboam, an income poop, if ever there was one, to Zedekiah, the born loser. Well, there are one or two bright stars, notably Josiah, Hezekiah, one or two relatively good like Jehoshaphat. But on the whole, it's not a pretty picture. You see, it's the whole idea that God would abandon the city, that He would give it to its enemies, is absolutely foreign to them. Way back in chapter 7, Jeremiah had said, do not say this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In other words, the king and his, and his advisors are attempting to prop up an institution which God has already judged. And don't we hear these voices today all around us, propping up decaying institutions which God may once have blessed, but blesses no longer. Loyalty to institutions, loyalty to establishment, over which, to use an Old Testament phrase, the word Ichabod, where is the glory? The glory has gone, is written. It comes from an earlier story when the Philistines captured the sacred ark, and Eli's daughter named her child Ichabod. The glory has gone. That's the irrationality of unbelief absolute refusal to accept that as an institution crumbles before their very eyes that God has not judged it. You see, that's what happens. It's not just internal decay. It's not just institutions growing old. It's that God has judged it. And God, why has God judged it? We'll come to that in a moment or two. And clutching at straws. Now, chapter 37, which is happening at the same time as this, Chapter 37, verse 5, tells us that Pharaoh's army had come out of Egypt and the Chaldeans had withdrawn from the siege. And of course, they think, you, you see the irrational, we, we need to depend on the old enemy. The old enemy, Egypt, will rescue us from Babylon. Now, Egypt had long, long passed its greatest days, but it was still a formidable fighting force. We know now from other sources that the Pharaoh had no intentions of saving Jerusalem. He was on his way to get tribute from the ports of Tyre and Sidon. But you see, people who will not accept reality will clutch at any kind of straw, any kind of, any, any kind of straw in the wind that makes them feel better. So we have the realism of faith that trusts in the word of the Lord, and we have the irrationality of unbelief that refuses to see what's unfolding. So that's the first part. Now, the second part, verses 8, so sorry, 6 to 15, is almost a kind of acted parable. Jeremiah does something which appears to be crazy. He buys a field. Now, what's the point of buying a field when the city and the fields are going to be destroyed? But you see, this is the apparent craziness of faith which takes the long view. His cousin comes to him, Hanamel, my cousin, verse 8, came to me in the court of the guard and says, Jeremiah, buy this field so that um, it won't uh, be lost to our family. I mean, think about it for a moment. This guy, Hanamel, must have been an insensitive boor coming to a guy in prison and saying, look, I don't have any money. Will you buy it for us? As Derek Kidner says in his little commentary, was there ever a more insensitive prison visitor? But, uh, I mean, and this is the apparent craziness of faith. But you see what Jeremiah does without fully understanding. He trusts in the word of the Lord. Verse 8, then I knew that it was the word of the Lord. 
You see, Jer what's happening here is Jeremiah has made these prophecies. God will bring back the people. The city will be rebuilt. Agriculture and commerce will flourish in it and around it. It's almost as if the Lord is saying, look, Jeremiah, do you believe this yourself? Are you willing to buy a field which shows your own trust? This is going to happen, that God will bring them back. Indeed, God does move in a mysterious way, His wonders to perform. And you'll notice all the technical details, the verses 9 and following, the, the money is paid out, the deed is signed, witnesses, and the terms and conditions and, and then they're stored in earthenware jars, which can preserve things for a long, long, long time, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in 1947, where manuscripts of the Scriptures had lasted for many, many centuries. So, you see the realism of this. But behind this story is a much older story. Jeremiah is saturated in the, in the words and in the stories of Moses. Remember how in Genesis 25, Abraham bought a field in the land of the Hittites, bought a field where, which was planting a stake in the promised land. Jeremiah knew there was going to be the exile in Egypt, and, sorry, Abraham knew there was going to be the exile in Egypt, and yet he buys a field in, and the cave of Machpelah. Now, that's a very interesting name. Machpelah is a Hebrew word which means the place with two entrances. I believe that's a little, in itself, it's another little illustration, tiny thread, if you like, in the whole tapestry of Scripture. It's a burial cave, but there is a way out. There is a way in, there's also a way out, pointing forward to resurrection, new hope, and restoration. So here, Jeremiah demonstrates his faith. And I'm going to buy this field. And he, his scribe Baruch, um, the man to whom we're almost certainly indebted in human terms for preserving the whole book of Jeremiah, Baruch, whom we meet first here, and his name is mentioned several times, he was the man almost certainly who gathered together the oracles and sermons and sayings of Jeremiah and preserved them. So that's the first thing, faith which takes risks, contrasted with the unrealism of unbelief, which refuses to see what is staring them in the face. And that merges into, excuse me, verses 16 to 25, a prayer which honestly wrestles with God. Jeremiah, as we sang, takes it to the Lord in prayer. That's what he does here. You see, in many ways, this is both a specific prayer and a model prayer. It's specific to the time, it's specific to the individual, specific to the place. In many ways, it's a model prayer. And there are two parts to this prayer. You'll notice how he begins, verse 17, Ah, Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth and by, by your great power and by your outstretched hand, nothing is too hard for you. In other words, he begins with the greatness of the God to whom he prays. Now, that is at the very heart of prayer. That's why the, the often quoted phrase, prayer changes things, is so inadequate. Strictly speaking, prayer changes nothing. It's the God to whom we pray that changes things. Remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal, their all-day prayer meeting, increasingly fanatical, increasingly, increasingly excited. They pray, they pray, they pray, they knock at Baal's door, and Baal is not in. The important thing about prayer is the God to whom we pray. And there's a brief but powerful summary of, of the God to whom he's praying. Verse 17, it is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched hands the very heart of Israel's faith. My help is in the name of Yahweh who made heaven and earth. Now, if he made heaven and earth, nothing in heaven and earth can oppose him. Nowhere in heaven and earth is outside, is outside his empire. No throne stands higher, no writ runs that can overturn his. And this runs through the Scripture, with the triumphant affirmation of Romans 8, Nothing, not height nor depth, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the bottom line, if you like. Who are we, to whom are we praying? We're praying to the one who made heaven and earth, the one who fills heaven and earth. And 
the one to whom nothing is too hard. And we'll come back to that in a moment because God himself echoes that phrase in his answer in verse 27. Then we, then his power in history, his power in time and space, the Exodus story, bringing his people out. But notice the, the specific thing that's, that, that's said about him, verse 18, you show steadfast love great covenant word heseth, the word that's used about the special love God has for his people. In other words, it's not just power, it is love. This God isn't just, a, if you like, a tremendous power who crushes lesser powers, not some kind of juggernaut through history crushing everything in his path. This is a God whose love uh, is as great as his power. That is the point that Jeremiah is making that is why the supreme example of both is the cross, is it not? Where love and justice meet, where God's power and God's love come together. And notice, of course, the human responsibility. Instead, we pay the guilt, O oh, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Then he runs through briefly the history of his people, signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, and among all mankind, verse 20, you, verse 21, you brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt. Very heart of Israel's faith. Every Passover, they remember this God who brought them out of Egypt. But there's still perplexity in the present, isn't there? Verse 24, we call the siege mounds, have come up to the city to take it. And because of sword and famine and pestilence, the city is given into the hands of the Chaldean Read the book of Lamentations and see something of the terrible conditions in Jerusalem during this siege. What you spoke has come to pass. But verse 25, so realistic, isn't it? Yet you, O Lord God, have sent to me, buy the field for money and get witnesses, though the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. See how important it was that Jeremiah begins with who God is, the kind of God he is, his power and his love. If it were simply some arbitrary random God he was praying to, he couldn't really trust him, could he? After all, the pagan gods were capricious, the pagan gods were fickle, the pagan gods could never be trusted, but this is a God who can be trusted. So, with the faithfulness of God, the driving force of the prayer, but still perplexity in the present. And don't, let, don't let's try to be super spiritual and pretend we don't have these perplexities when we pray, because we do. We pray and we genuinely believe, but we still wrestle with fear and with worry. Remember what James says, a double-minded person will receive nothing from the Lord. Now, James is not talking there, I believe, about the uncertainties and fears we all have when we pray. James there, I think, is talking about when we pray and don't really mean what we pray. When we ask for things we don't really want, when we ask for changes we're not prepared to make and so on. But this is the prayer of faith. Lord, it looks crazy. Lord, it I don't know why you're asking me to do this, but I am going to do it. Like what Puddle Glum says in the silver chair, I hate this, it's awful, but Aslan's asked us, so we've got to do it. And I think the faith of Puddle Glum is far more honest than the faith of the super spiritual. So that's the prayer, the prayer which on wrestles honestly with God. And then that merges, because the chapter is very beautifully constructed, into the answer of God. Verses, verses 26 to the end, verses 26 to 44. The answer which is both humbling and reassuring. Verse 26, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Well, you'll notice how he encourages Jeremiah by echoing the very words that Jeremiah had spoken in verse 17. Nothing is too hard for you. But you see, once again, this is echoing an earlier story, once again echoing the story of Abraham. These words, is anything too hard for the Lord, come first of all in the book of Genesis, chapter 18. Abraham and Sarah 
after long, long years of waiting and frustration, are told the child is going to be born. Sarah, of course, cannot believe this. How on earth am I, when I am old, going to have a child? My husband, who's nearly a hundred, how on earth is it going to happen? And she laughs. You see, and then God says, look, Sarah, is anything too hard for the Lord? Reminder, the very existence of God's people depended on a miracle, miracle of the birth of Isaac. So you see how powerful that is in the context. God's people are down, as it were. They're not yet out, but they're certainly down. The purpose of God seems to be running into the sands. It did seem in that earlier story. So any, anything that's going to happen now, any good that's going to come, is going to come because nothing is too hard for the Lord. Now, the answer really is in two parts. Just as the prayer was in two parts, so is the answer. First of all, in verses, 20, in verses 28 to 35, the, God says the exile is God's just judgment. You see, God confirms the words of Jeremiah. Zedekiah refuses to believe this. The establishment refuses to believe it. God says, more or less, Jeremiah, you're, you're telling the truth. I am going to destroy the city. You see, if God is who Jeremiah says he is, the faithful, unchanging, holy God, he cannot simply ignore the sins of his people. Verse um, 28, I am giving this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall capture it. The explanation for the exile also occurs in Daniel. At an earlier stage of the exile, Nebuchadnezzar comes against Jerusalem, and we are told the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. And the reason for it, it's a grim, grim tale, beginning, if you, if you like, with routine you might call routine idolatry. I call it routine because this has become more or less a way of life. The Chaldeans have offerings made to Baal and drink offerings and being poured out to other gods to provoke me to anger. Now, excavations in, the, in Jerusalem of the time of this has discovered in house after house little figurines of pagan gods, showing that Jeremiah was not exaggerating as Ezekiel and other prophets were telling the truth. Routine idolatry which sadly began with the great Solomon himself in his later years, 1 Kings 11, when he, when he ceased to worship the Lord exclusively and turned his heart to pagan gods. And it, it's true of both kingdoms, verse 30, the children of Judah and the children of Israel. It's idolatry that, um, I mean, idolatry, like other diseases, isn't particular about the company it keeps, and it will spread anywhere. And that's emphasized in verse 32, the evil the children of Israel, the children of Judah did, and notice it spreads through the whole of society, the kings and their officials, their priests and their prophets. The leaders led the way in idolatry, but the people followed, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's been the problem. The whole of society has been infiltrated with idolatry. God's people en masse have turned against him and culminating in the, the culminating in in the last verses they have turned to me verse 33 their back and not their face I have taught them persistently words of Jeremiah himself words of other prophets Isaiah in an earlier generation prophets like Habakkuk Nahum and others who had come and brought the word of the Lord and much earlier still Elijah and Elisha and before them Samuel beginning with Moses himself then verse 35 the culmination this awful offering up their sons and daughters to Moloch the Canaanite Phoenician cult of baby sacrifice, this terrible, terrible outrage to the Lord, which had been introduced by Zedekiah's grandfather, Manasseh, who had systematically undone all the reforms of his great father, Hezekiah. You see, that is the story. How could that city not be judged? So, the exile is God's just judgment. There needs to be a clearing out. The rubbish must be got rid of. There must be a cleansing. There must be a purifying. 
But verses 36 to 44, beyond the exile, there is hope. And the hope lies, verse 40, I will make with them an everlasting covenant. Now, we're going to develop that next week because it's um, particularly talked about in the following chapter, 33. See, the covenant isn't just new, it's everlasting. This is picked up in the book of Revelation, and, and it's where it's called an eternal gospel. This everlasting covenant, as I said last week, is not new in the sense that no one's ever heard it before, but it is new in the sense that it's going to culminate in Jesus Christ Himself, the one who is to die in this very place, not just for the sins of Jerusalem, but for the sins of the whole world. And there will be radical conversion. Verse 38, they shall be my people and I will be their God. The essence of covenant, uh, the essence of covenant, I will be their God. That was always true, even when he was judging them. But they will be my people. That is the part that had been broken. That's the part that's going to be put right. Verse 39, um, they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of the children after them partly, of course, in this world, but more fully in the world to come. I will make with them an everlasting covenant. And then verse 41, once again, God is reassuring the prophet. He quotes the words he, he gave to the prophet in chapter 1. The prophet, remember, had a negative ministry, a ministry to tear down, to get rid of what, what was evil. He also had a positive ministry to build and to plant. Verse 41, I will plant them in this land. That, of course, is the imagery of the vine, the vine which was Israel, which the Lord took out of Egypt, planted in the promised land, and, and it produced a bad and, and, and desperately sour harvest of grapes. That vine is going to be replanted. Remember the words of our Lord Himself, I am the true vine. What Israel failed to be, I am, and whoever is planted in me, whoever is a branch grafted onto me, that will grow. You see, there's a very interesting phrase at the end of verse 41. I will plant, rejoice in doing good, I will plant them in this land in all faithfulness, and then this word, which you could almost not notice, with all my heart and all my soul, that's used elsewhere, calling God's people to love Him with all their heart and all their soul. Uniquely here, it's used of the Lord Himself. In other words, we can only love Him with our heart and soul because He loves us. We love Him, says John, because He first loved us. Radical conversion, confirmation of the truth, of Jeremiah's words. And in the last few verses, verse 42, for thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great disaster upon this people, I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. As I had already said that, I, the Lord, create good and evil. There's no dualism in the universe. There's no equal and opposite power. The Lord controls everything. But it's in, look at verse 43, fields shall be bought in this land of which you are saying it is a desolation without man or beast given into the hands of the Chaldean. What's the Lord doing? The Lord saying, Jeremiah, you were right to buy that field because buying that field, it's not just you who's buying the field. I am going to restore the fields. I am going to restore the various parts of the land. Verse 44, deeds shall be signed and sealed and witnesses, witness exactly what Jeremiah had done as an act of faith in the various places, cities of Judah and the various parts of the kingdom. They are going to be restored. It's painful. It's bitter. It's hard. But you see how the story, how the prayer, and how the answer hang together. The story gives us the prose, if you like. This is the actual situation the prayer looks beyond the actual situation to a much bigger situation, the Lord restoring. And the answer confirms that God is faithful and what He has promised will happen. And why is that? Because nothing is too hard for the Lord. Amen. Let's pray.
Lord God, we come to you in great weakness. We admit the fickleness and feebleness of our faith for our lack of real conviction so often. We praise you, Lord, that you are the Lord who loves us with all your heart and all your soul. You're the God who one day will restore fortunes. You're the God who will one day bring in the kingdom for which we long because nothing is too hard for you. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 877, reminding us that whatever difficulties there may be to face, that the Lord will bring about restoration. Particularly the last verse, the soul that in Jesus has found its repose, he will not, he cannot desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, he'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Number 877. Peter writes, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Until that day dawns, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and all whom we love till we see him face to face. Amen.